Welcome to Gospel Compass. This is a podcast of the Goodlettsville and Gallatin Church. I'm Pastor Tim Stotler, and I'm joined today with a very, very special guest. Number one, he's the father of our piano player, Ken Barker. This is Dr. Ken Barker Sr., and I am thrilled to have you with us today because he has a perspective that many of us uh, have never even thought about. He has been the chief editor of the NIV Bible. He's worked on that that for probably, what, 40 or 50 years altogether? Well, for the NIV from 1971 through 2011. Well, there we go. So that's a, that's an incredible amount of time. And he also worked on a Bible that I use a lot. I use both of these a lot. The NASB was a, a translator for that, right? Yes, I helped translate the Old Testament part of that. Excellent. Yes. He's written commentaries on Micah and Zechariah. He's written a, a two books, one about how the process of translation came in in the NIV, and also I think about the accuracy of the NIV, would yes. that be fair, Yes. Uh, as, where, as well as other things. And so what a joy to have you with us today, and I really appreciate you taking the time. My joy and pleasure and blessing, I assure you. How many uh, children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren do you have all together? We have four children, and uh, our oldest, Ken Barker, and his wife couldn't have children of their own, and so they started adopting international children and couldn't stop that day until they had 11. <laughs> and what a blessing all those kids are. So they're from different countries, uh, China, India, Vietnam, Latvia, Ethiopia, Philippines. Did I leave out any? I think this is <laughs> Ken's actually joining us here today in the studio. We want to just talk about this process of Bible translation. We want to talk specifically about the NIV. I preach from the NIV. Uh, it is, he's going to explain more, more about what that translation is and why it exists. And maybe even talk a little bit about the newest version of the study Bible. A study Bible is a Bible that has tools within it that explain, that give illustration, that show pictures of where things happened. And it is a very, very important tool for any Christian who's wanting to grow in their faith. And so maybe you'll talk to us a little bit about that work, which was recently finished. And so, again, thanks for being here today. Talk to us a little bit about your work on the NIV and why that Bible is so important to you. Well, in 1971, uh, I received a call from Dr. Ed Palmer, who was the executive secretary of the NIV Committee on Bible Translation, inviting me to join the committee. And uh, I said no. <laughs> and uh, he, though, was persistent. And so, uh, I, I, by the way, I had just finished helping to translate the NASB. And uh, I gave an immediate no. And uh, he said, well, why? I said, well, partly because I just helped translate the NASB and I liked its more literal uh, mm -hmm. approach, and uh, so I'm not sure that I would be happy with uh, a translation that's not as literal as the NASB. Well, he phoned me back about nine months later and said, uh, Ken, uh, our committee is meeting in St. Louis, Missouri uh, in the spring, and we have set it up in St. Louis, Missouri uh, during your spring break. <laughs> and so we know you can carve out two weeks <laughs> during this time, and it's not too long a drive or a flight from Dallas to St. Louis. I was on the faculty of Dallas Seminary at that time. And uh, he said, we'll be doing a final reading of, uh, the, uh, of the book of uh, Zechariah. Yeah, it was the book of Zechariah. And uh, we would like you to uh, just come and help and uh, hear us out. And uh, if uh, you don't like it, then we will never call you again. <laughs> but uh, if you like it, then we'll make you an immediate member. Well, that sounded reasonable to me, mm -hmm. so to that I said yes. And during those two weeks, I just became totally 100% sold on uh, the approach that they were using in the NIV. And that takes us just briefly into the three major types of translations. 
Uh, the NASB is a more literal approach to the translation task. Uh, at the opposite end of the scale would be the free translations, and uh, I don't like those, most of them at least, although I will consult them occasionally, uh, but to me they don't make an ideal church use uh, mm -hmm. Bible. I think they're too free. And so that means that my approach, my desired approach, is, is a middle-of-the-ground uh, approach, balanced, mediating, that tries to be neither too literal nor too free. And I discovered in those two weeks that that's exactly the kind of translation that they were trying to produce in the mm -hmm. NIV. When you have the, the literal, you're trying to go word for word as accurately as possible to translate those original languages into the modern language. But a lot of times that requires, that requires wording that we're not as, as, as familiar with. And because it's so literal, and it's written in a time that, where the grammar and so forth is not so much like ours, it's hard to really understand. Yes. And so if you've ever read the King James Bible, you'll understand what that's like. First of all, the King James Bible is written in, a, it's written in the English language, which is an English language we really don't speak anymore. That's correct. And then on the other side of that is maybe something that's for a non-Christian or somebody that's a new Christian. It's, it's so translated that it's, that it's not true to the original. It's trying to get across an idea, and it's very much in a modern language. And so the NIV is what you call the middle of the road, yes. mm -hmm. as accurate as possible, but as understandable and easy to read and certainly easy to share in a public worship service, as we did to, today in worship. Yes, and so let me share with you a true story about the... Uh Oh, antiquated uh, approach that's in the King James. Uh, there are a lot of people who were diehard King James fans and users, and one of our translators is a friend of mine, colleague of mine, Dr. Ronald Youngblood, who is also a professor of uh, Hebrew and Old Testament studies, just as I was. And we were very close, uh, dear friends. We worked together uh, on both the NIV and the NIV Study Bible. And uh, he told me a true story once when he was walking with a friend, and the friend uh, asked him what he was doing. He said, I'm working on the new N NIV uh, translation. And he said, why? We have the King James. It's good enough. Uh, <laughs> so there's no need for another one. And uh, Ron then asked, do you understand everything you read in the King James? He said, oh, yes, I have no problem. And said Ron, then Ron said, I notice you're carrying a King James Version. So he was, had one in his hand as mm. they were walking along. And he said, give it to me. And so he gave it to him. And that just to show that he was not playing any tricks or anything, he held the Bible up and just let it flop over and wherever it would. He didn't pick anything in advance. He just let it naturally fall over. He said, now give it to me. And he started reading down the first column, got about halfway down the first column, and said, read that verse. So he took it and read it. He said, do you understand what that means? He said, I haven't the foggiest idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think many of us have felt that way sometimes <laughs> reading the, the King James. Again, a beautiful, beautiful. The, the language of it's beautiful. Many of us memorized passages out of sure, the King James. Sure, I, so I it's, did. It's beautiful. We thank God that it's been there uh, all that time. But at the same time, it, 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 it puts the scriptures at a distance, mm -hmm. which is not what we want. We want the scriptures to be accessible. So you, I, I, t I take it that after that two weeks, you got on board. Yes, I did. And uh, shortly after that, uh, they promoted me to secretary of the committee, and I remained a secretary for 30 years. Mm. Uh, but I continued to work with them. Uh, when I was secretary, I not only chaired or moderated the, uh, the work sessions, and by the way, the, NIV, the top NIV Committee on Bible Translation is a 15-person committee. That's the steering committee that, that controls the work on the NIV. Hmm. And uh, the NIV was one of the most thorough translations ever produced. It had uh, uh, several levels. Uh, there was, first of all, the basic translation level where the team, we had teams who did initial translations. 
And then their work was bumped up to what we called intermediate translation committees, and they reviewed the work of the previous committee and added new work of their own, and then they bumped their work up to the general editorial committee, and they also uh, went through the work of the two previous committees and then did a lot of their own work, adding their own work to it, and then they promoted uh, their work up to our top mm. NIV Quite a committee. filter, I would think. I know of no other Bible translation yeah. that was as thorough yeah. as the NIV. Because now, I think some people might not understand how this happens. And if you, let's take a diversion here for a moment. We know that there have been some cults, for instance, that have taken the King James Bible and somebody retranslated that however they wanted to mm -hmm. and found out later that they didn't even know how to read Greek or Hebrew. That's they right. simply just took an English version, retranslated it, and therefore it's full of errors, full of things that are not theologically correct. But when you're talking about how thorough this is, they didn't just take a King James Version. They took every scrap that they could find, uh, thousands of pieces of documents dating back hundreds of years, and, uh, and, and poured over these documents, I'm assuming. Yes, and definitely. And mm -hmm. not only did they pour over it individually, but poured over it as groups, and then continued to go through the refinement. You see... We understand now probably Greek and Hebrew better than it did when the King James Bible was translated. Well, definitely, and another uh, disadvantage at the, of the King James translators is they only had about six or seven Greek manuscripts mm. in the New Testament. Today, we have over 5,000 wow. uh, Greek manuscripts, papyrus fragments, and mm. uh, so on. So we have much greater access to ancient Greek texts of the New Testament um, some of these were not available to the King James, many of them were not available to the King James translators and their earlier uh, manuscripts and papyrus fragments also. So they had, they had later ones. That's correct. And you've been able, well you, but the, the teams have been able to find earlier and the earlier the better. Yes. Because we don't have any of the original documents that were written by any of the any of the apostles or Old Testament documents, but we do have many, many, many copies. We have earlier copies than the mm -hmm. King James uh, translators had. And in fact, there is a papyrus fragment of the Gospel of John that's almost back to 100 is that right? AD, which is just a few years after the New Testament was completed mm. uh, by John in Revelation, which was completed around AD 95. We have a, a, a fragment of John Hmm. That's dated almost back to the top of the time, time of these, the apostles. These John. scribes that would translate this, they were extremely, extraordinarily careful. Yes, they would. Yeah. They would count to what letter should be in the middle of that page, and mm -hmm. if it wasn't right, they would start all over again. Now that would be amazing yes. handwriting, doing all that. But they were extremely careful. We know this, and so you feel confident that what we have in the NIV, as well as other translations like the NASB is true to those original writings that we don't have, but we know based upon, we, you call it textual criticism. Yeah, I started to say there's a science of textual criticism, uh, which is, uh, well, it's made up of textual critics, scholars who are trained in uh, studying and dating uh, ancient uh, manuscripts, papyrus fragments, mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, they... Uh, are the ones who have told us that all the King James translators had were about six or seven late yes. manuscripts mm -hmm. of the uh, New Testament. But today, as I mentioned, we have over 5,000, and most of them are earlier, that's closer to the original. Yeah. And the closer you are to the original, that means they've been copied less, as you copy, mm -hmm. then more and more errors can creep in right. as you copy and copy and copy. But we have texts that go all the way back to the time of the original, mm -hmm. the next generation yeah. uh, after that. And so we textual critics have access to all of those. And uh, and I think the earlier manuscripts are the are the more, more correct ones just yeah. because they are closer, closer. to now, the th original. This brings up an issue that oftentimes we'll hear with people who love the uh, King James, and by the yes. way, nothing wrong with the King James. We no. love the King James too. Well, I love but it, and I was brought up. Brought on up it. on it, uh, <laughs> but that that 
that books like the translations like the NIV, they would say, why did you leave these things out? Mm -hmm. Now, that's an important question yeah. because we certainly don't want to be taking yeah. anything out of the Word of yeah. God. Maybe you could explain how that happened. Yes, well, the King James translators had primarily late Greek manuscripts and papyrus fragments. Uh, today, as I mentioned, we have uh, 5,000 and some later. Earlier. Uh, I mean, yeah. manuscripts and papyrus fragments that have been discussed, discovered uh, later, later. Okay. after what they had mm -hmm. that are much closer to the original. And a whole science of textual criticism developed with principles to follow and so on. And one of the major principles is the ones closer to the originals would be more accurate, more more dependable. Uh, there are all kinds of other rules and principles, too, dealing with uh, things like mistakes made in copying mm -hmm. and how to find those and how to correct them and mm. uh, all sorts of, uh, of, uh, of rules and principles to follow. And the work of textual critics has presented, uh, that work has presented to us today bound volumes of the Hebrew Bible that include all the work of these textual critics. Mm. The same applies to the New Testament. You can get a Greek New Testament in a book, bound book form, and it includes all the work of these textual critics with all the manuscripts listed, the dating of them, and principles they followed, and everything. That's amazing. One of the things that you might not understand is that whenever the King James sat down, as you said, they only had six, six sources from which to draw, which yes. thank God they had them. Yeah. But you need to understand that over time, scribes, uh, for instance, might write a commentary. For instance, your Bible right here has commentary in it. Yes. And it's down at the bottom. It's separated from the body. Yes. But not always were commentaries no. separated. No. They could have written something in the side or whatever, and that may have made its way in a commentary may have made its way in, and so mm -hmm. the next person who copies yeah. it writes that down. Well, if you go back and you find 10 copies of the same book that were earlier but didn't have that commentary in it, you would say that's a later edition. Yes. And thus, whenever you, whenever you do the NIV, those things that you found that were later editions don't make it in. So the question isn't, why was it left out? The question is, why was it ever put in there in the first place? Yeah, that happened in both the Old Testament and the New uh, in manuscripts and papyrus fragments in both the Hebrew and Aramaic texts of the Old Testament and the Greek text in the New Testament, scribes wrote things in the margins. Hmm. They, they have the main text, but then they wrote uh, commentaries or other readings, and sometimes it's just their own personal suggestion mm -hmm. here and there in the margins. And at times, some of those personal uh, notations in the margin in copying and recopying made their way into the text. Yes. And uh, they really don't belong there. <laughs> it was part of just notes and commentary mm -hmm. and so on. But that happened. But textual critics can spot those mm -hmm. and uh, eliminate them. What a process. What an yeah. amazing process. Yeah. So you end up with the NIV, which you said earlier became the number one selling Bible and still is. Yes. And yes. Uh, what, a, what a blessing it has to be for you personally to know that that you were part of a team that helped get the Word of God into people's hands in a way they could understand it, yet a way that they could find authoritative, they yeah. could build their life off of it. You want to tell us a little bit more about the NIV and, and that yeah. work? Yes. Uh, briefly, the story of translating the NIV can be summed up by answering three main questions. Uh, first, uh, who's going to sponsor it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the uh, sponsorship is very important. It doesn't matter whether it's the King James or the RSV or the NIV. Uh, they all have uh, sponsoring organizations. And it just so happened, uh, I'm not going to tell the whole story because it would take too long, but it just so happened that in case of the NIV, a Bible Society called the International Bible Society, which is also now known as Biblica, uh, made it clear that they wanted to uh, uh, sponsor, financially sponsor, mm. the translation of a new translation. They didn't call it 
it wasn't the NIV at that mm -hmm. point. The title hadn't been chosen, but they made it clear that they they wanted to uh, uh, financially sponsor a new one. And so they did become then the uh, financial sponsor, and it's very expensive because the first thing you have to do then next is who's going to uh, steer, govern uh, such a project. Mm. Well, that means you have to then form what we what came to be called the NIV Committee on Bible Translation, abbreviated CBT. And uh, that was made up of 15 persons, 15 scholars who knew Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, uh, well-versed in those languages. Uh, and that became the steering committee. Then another question is who's going to do the major initial translation work? And uh, that committee then chose altogether around 120 uh, Bible translators, mm -hmm. mostly scholars from seminaries who knew Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek, for literally from all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, all over the English-speaking world. Yeah. Uh, and that would take us then to Europe and England and, s and South Africa and so on. Uh, and so we had translators with all those English backgrounds involved who all could use Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. And so that means we had a total of around 120 translators uh, doing that task. Uh, that's then when Ed Palmer, uh, the executive secretary, he's the one who became the executive secretary of that NIV Committee on Bible Translation, the 15-person committee. And uh, so he's the one who invited me, and I first said no. Mm -hmm. And then later, uh, after he called me again, Mm -hmm. and had me involved for two weeks, uh, that sold me. And so I joined the committee then, and in, well, a year or two after that, they decided I should be the secretary <laughs> real, real fast. Yeah. And so I remained that for uh, 30 years. But then even after I retired after 30 years, I continued on the committee and continued chairing and moderating the work sessions until the 2011 edition was completed. And uh, it was completed uh, then in uh, 2011, mm -hmm. and I was 80 at that point. <laughs> and so I told them, I think I'm old enough now that I've com com helped you complete the uh, 2011, 2011 edition, and so I'm retiring from it. But I continued to make it clear to Zondervan that I did want to continue as general editor of the NIV Study Bible. Study Bible. Uh, and they agreed to that. Mm -hmm. And that then led uh, later to my proposing to Zondervan about six or seven years ago. I think the time has come for us to rework the study Bible. And I only had one uh, previous general uh, um, associate editor left. Uh, usually it's a five-person committee, it's a general editor and then four associate editors, mm -hmm. five altogether. Uh, and only two of us were left, myself and Mark Strauss, who was a uh, professor of Greek and New Testament at Bethel Seminary in San Diego. And so uh, when I made the proposal to Zondervan, I said, I need to select uh, at least uh, two other associate editors who turned out to be Craig Blomberg, from, uh, who's specialist in Greek at uh, Denver Seminary, and then uh, Williams, uh, a uh, fellow named uh, Williams, I think his first name is Philip, but it's Williams, mm -hmm. Dr. Williams. And uh, he was professor of Hebrew and Old Testament at Calvin Seminary in Grand Rapids. And so the lady vice president of Bible publishing at Zondervan said, uh, I like those, but I still have another need. I said, what's that? I need a woman associate editor on there. I said, well, it just so happens that as I was serving and moderating and chairing the work sessions of the NIV Committee on Bible Translation, that we had uh, three or four women mm -hmm. on that 15-person committee. And uh, one of them was Dr. Janine Brown, professor of Greek and New Testament at Bethel Seminary uh, in San Diego. And so... I said she made uh, quite a few good suggestions uh, in our work on the top committee, CBT, 
And uh, there were several other women involved too, but I think the one that stood out the most mm -hmm. to me was Dr. Janine Brown. And she said, okay, let's go with her. So I said to Mark, since she worked at the same seminary, I said, Mark, call her and, and uh, ask if she'll join the committee. He said, I know what the answer is going to be. And I said, I know too, because who's going to pass, pass up <laughs> an opportunity like that? Oh, and good. so she said, but I'll call. He called, and then he called right back and said, she said yes. Yeah, all right. As, as we knew she would. <laughs> and so I um, announced that to the uh, vice president of Bible publishing at Zahneman. She said, wonderful. I approve 100% lock, stock, and barrel, everything in your proposal now. Wow. And so she turned us loose then, and uh, we had total freedom. And that was at the age of 84. Yes, it was. And you just finished it last year. Yes, I had six years. Uh, so called out of retirement that. again. Yes. And so I hope the rest of us can have that kind of energy. And influence. Well, I wondered if she would accept my proposal <laughs> just because of my age. But it just so happens that my main liaison to Zonderman Bible Publishers was Mike Vanderclip, good Dutchman. It's a Dutch name. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Vanderclip at Zondervan ever since the early 1990s. He's been my main liaison to mm -hmm. Zondervan. And so uh, when she expressed some doubt to him about my age, he said, you have nothing to worry about, <laughs> he said. And you're almost 90 today, and yes. I think you could probably do another one if you well, had to. <laughs> if, if I stay the way I yeah. am right now, I could, but I don't expect to. Uh, but I did want to produce one more. Yeah, now I let's wanted, talk about that real quick. Because I wanted to produce the 2020 fully revised edition of the NIV Study Bible. Because you might have some confusion if you're new to this. We have the Bible translation, which there are many Bible translations, and they're in many, not just English, but languages all over the world. That process continues today, thank yes. God, mm -hmm. for people that never had the Bible in their language. So that's an important process. You, you, you talked about some things that go into that translation. And, and so accuracy is one of them. Yes. Is, are we getting as close to the original intent as possible? Uh, I think so, yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, more accurate than the King James more, And then you be. also have, what, readability? Yeah, well, if you're going to get into philosophy of translation... Mm -hmm. Talk about that for a minute. And what kind of translation okay. the NIV is, uh, and the kind of that we came up with mm -hmm. is, is uh, mediating or balance, but then I need to comment briefly on the other two That's major fine. categories. Yeah. The two major categories of Bible translations without using the dynamic equivalents and other technical names mm -hmm. to describe them, I can use simple words to yes. say the same thing. Good, because I'm not very smart. <laughs> uh, well, the average listener or yeah. Bible reader wouldn't understand some of the technical terms I mm -hmm. would use. So primarily there are literal translations and two examples of those would be the NASB and the King James. Mm -hmm. Then at the opposite end of the spectrum you would have the free translations which are not literal but to much take a much freer approach uh, to the translation task and that would include ones like uh, the contemporary English version and the uh, modern English, the mm -hmm. uh, uh, there are many of them. Yes, yeah. and and others. But uh, when we set about to translate the NIV, we really wanted to avoid being either too literal or too mm -hmm. free. We wanted to produce a more balanced translation, uh, one that would strike a happy medium between the other two major types. And uh, I'm the one who came up mm -hmm. with the t t two titles. Either one would, was happy with me, mediating and or balanced. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's been accepted since then, by the way. A, a, a translator, a Bible translator uh, who translates into foreign languages yeah. uh, takes things like the NIV and, and while looking at Hebrew and Greek. Mm -hmm. but. They were also looking at English translations like the NIV. And uh, he wrote a book about Bible, translating the Bible. And he referred to me and what I said in one okay. of my books. And uh, he said, there are three <laughs> mm. types of translations. 
instead of just the two that most people talk so literal, about. free, and mediating. Which right, the NIA mediating or balanced. Now that process then would be a little bit more complex because if it's literal, you're just trying to get as close as you can. That's correct. Your process is we've got to find out the truth of what that original is. We've got to get yeah. as close to that That's as we can. Right. Yeah. Then we have to put it in a way that people can understand it. Yes, definitely. That, that, yeah. that a casual reader will be able mm -hmm. to pick that up. That's where the trick is, isn't yeah. it? Yes, it is. In that uh, freer approach, uh, that can include things like paraphrases, mm, paraphrase, uh, which right. are not really direct translations. They're mm -hmm. too free to be called a translation, and many of those are more paraphrases right. than, than translations. Uh, but he quoted me because coming up with that term, and he said there are several versions that belong in that category too. And he said number one in that category would be the NIV. Mm -hmm. Now, personally, that's why God has uh, blessed uh, the NIV, NIV as He has. Uh, the King James led all Bible translations in sales until 1989. But starting in 1989, the NIV started outselling the King James and all other mm -hmm. Bible translations. And it has uh, outsold the King James every year since 1989 and right on up until today. It is mm -hmm. still the best-selling translation That's an excellent, I'll say in this, the world. I enjoy it very much. I do, as a pastor, I've, obviously we've tried to dig into the Greek and the Hebrew and go back as original as we can. Yes. But uh, as far as being able to share with my, uh, you heard me got to preach this morning, I preached yeah. out of the NIV. Yeah. Yes. I went in and talked about some Greek originals, etc. but we want to make sure that people can understand it. So what an incredible thing to have, have been able to lead a team and work in a team that's created a Bible that's been used as much as this one. Is this helpful? And again, you can trust it, that when you read mm -hmm. it, it is right. I would like to say also, we have been talking about two different things. We've been talking about a Bible translation. The NIV is a Bible translation, the New International Version. And so that's put into a language that tries to contain the truth and make it understandable, that middle of the road. But also, we've also been talking about something called study Bible. Now, this is something that, again, you didn't retranslate the NIV necessarily, but you did come up with new study guides or yes. new materials. Yeah. And so in that Bible, there are things there that are there to help you. And some explanations of words, maybe customs that would be pointed out that, so that we might have a better understanding of it. Mm -hmm. Even maps and photographs that are study guides so that a person who's on their own would probably be able to understand great chunks of the Bible without even anybody having to teach them. Yes. And that's a huge help, all right there in one book. I think I can safely say my three greatest joys were, I say were because one of them is past, uh, were uh, first translating mm. the Bible. And uh, I translated the Bible from 1969 through 2011. Wow. And uh, then, in addition to translating the Bible, which I love, I got to produce the NIV Study Bible. Mm because in the Lord's timing, he called the original general editor of the NIV Study Bible home to glory. And uh, they all, uh, all the parties involved, which would be uh, the Bible Society, which was a financial sponsor mm -hmm. of the NIV, and Zondervan, the publisher, mm -hmm. uh, and then the NIV Committee on Bible Translation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those three groups got together to figure out who should replace him and then the, they decided uh, that since Ed was wearing three hats involving three different organizations or groups, mm -hmm. the Bible Society, the Bible Publisher, and then the committee that really controls mm -hmm. the text of the NIV, uh, the president of the society said he'd like to meet with me and to present a proposal. And at that point, I had no idea what he's talking about, but... He, I was at Dallas Seminary at that point, and the Bible site at that point was located in New Jersey, so he flew from uh, New Jersey to uh, Dallas DFW Airport and met with me for lunch, in a long lunch, hmm. and explained uh, all that had happened and what the great need is now and what the arrangement would be and everything. And he said, 
these three entities, he said Ed Palmer was wearing three hats, really, involving three different mm -hmm. organizations. And uh, he said these three groups got together to decide who should replace Ed. And he said all three unanimously, and he said, I repeat, unanimously agreed as to who should replace him. <laughs> and he said, Ken... You couldn't say no to that, could you? Ken, <laughs> Ken said, and he told me, uh, and they unanimously agree that it should be you. And uh, in the tribute to this yes. new one, they refer to what I said at that point. This doesn't tell, give you yeah. the background of that. Mm -hmm. What I was doing now is giving you the background of that, where that mm -hmm. statement came from. But when I heard those words, all three unanimously agree that you should replace Ed in those three hats. And my first thought was, who am I to say no to God? That's right. <laughs> because when you've got that kind of unanimity yeah. from three quarters, that would, to me, it's be almost impossible to say no to something like that. And so that's how that position came about. Well, we thank you for saying yes to that. I thank you for saying yes to being willing to sit down with us today and talk about this process, something that's foreign to many of us, but I think very comforting to know that this kind of care went into these Bible translations. And also, I want to say thank you for providing us with a new study Bible that's fresh off the presses. Yes, yes it if is. If you get that NIV study Bible, you're going to see his name in the front of it and a beautiful tribute, as we yeah. mentioned, to uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Ken Barker for the hard work that he's put in. We are blessed today as the church to have this resource. I hope that you get this resource or something similar like this in your hand. And uh, we are very grateful to you that God's given you long life and health. Uh, we're very grateful for the son that he gave you that blesses us here at our church, who is also an editor of many hymnals, including the one that's mm -hmm. in our pew. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're very thankful for the legacy that you have and that continues. Thank you so much for joining me today and for being a part of our worship here at Goodittsville Church. Well, uh, amen and thank you, and I assure you it's my joy and pleasure and blessing. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for Gospel Compass with Dr. Ken Barker.